Hi guys, this is Drew with Princess Craft RV and today we're going to be walking through the R-Pod 171. We're going to start right up front here with the loading and unloading procedure and we're going to talk about that for a little bit. Uh, so what you have here is your locking coupler uh, with your tow chain. So uh, starting out, we're going to start with this coupler raised up about three inches above your ball and drop. Uh, of course, we are going to center ourselves underneath the coupler and lower ourselves back down. Uh, once fully seated on that ball, we're going to slide this back and go ahead and, and make sure that this secondary catch is actually catching on that mechanism. And then I always go back and, and give that a pull uh, to make sure that we are firmly locked on. Uh, from here, it's going to be our recommendation that you use some sort of secondary pin to keep that from potentially rattling loose going down the road. Uh, keep in mind that that is not included with your purchase. Uh, and that is something that you would need to add at the time of delivery. Uh, also, we're going to take your tow chains here and we are going to cross these underneath the coupler and we're going to hook those onto the receiver of the vehicle. It is state law in Texas that these do need to be crossed underneath the coupler as well as they cannot make contact with the ground at any time. So uh, make sure you're skating that line to where you have enough room to make your turns left to right, but not so much room that these may fall in contact with the pavement. Riding right next to those tow chains is going to be your emergency breakaway cable here. Uh, very important safety feature. This is your last line of defense. Uh, if you have any failure from these other tow components, as the two vehicles separate, this is going to act like a rip cord to the electric brake system, uh, essentially pulling that cord and putting full 12 volts to those electric brakes uh, to avoid a runaway camper scenario. Now this does need to have its own separate connection point on the receiver. And again, uh, you're, th that is not something that is provided at, time of at the time of delivery. So you are going to use a carabiner, quick link, uh, whichever you have to make that third connection point on the uh, receiver. Uh, we also have your uh, seven way plug here. This is going to plug into the corresponding receptacle on your vehicle. This is going to give you full function to your tow vehicle's lights, uh, brake system, charging system, things like that. So it, it's going to uh, just plug again directly into that corresponding receptacle on your bumper. Uh, hopping up here to your electric tongue jack, uh, we have uh, first switch is going to be a light that's going to give us a point of reference if you're backing up to the unit after dark, uh, or maybe if you're doing any loading and unloading after dark, it could help light this uh, space as well. Uh, below that, we have an up or down uh, switch there, that's a momentary switch, clearly marked up or down uh, in terms of direction. Uh, in the event that you do have a power loss situation, you can still operate this jack very easily. Uh, we are going to remove that uh, rubber plug there, uh, grab this crank handle, of course line up the drive nut there with the crank handle. That will allow us to uh, manipulate this either up or down, again, in the event of a power loss situation. Hopping right back behind there, we have your 20-pound uh, propane tank. Same variant you're going to find on any gas grill. This is the most common propane cylinder out there in the wild. Uh, open and close valve here on the top. Uh, very straightforward, very clearly marked uh, as far as open and close. Now, when it comes to removing your tank, you are, of course, going to want to uh, make sure you go ahead and close that valve. We would then at that point go ahead and remove the propane uh, pigtail and lo loosen the tension band here and that tank's going to go ahead and lift right out of there. Uh, when, when you go ahead and, and get the, the tank filled and returning it back to service, of course, put it back down there into the tension band, go ahead and tighten that down finger tight. Make sure you're screwing your propane pigtail on nice and tight, and then we can go ahead and turn that valve on. Now this is all covered going down the road by this propane cover that we have here at my feet. And this gets held on with a, a couple different ways. So uh, of course, make sure your door is orientated correctly. That opening is going to be uh, towards the camper. So we're going to slip that on there uh, over the tank, and it might be slightly fiddly. Uh, what we are looking here is on the back of that bracket that holds that propane regulator is a little threaded stud and it can take some work to get that lined up with the propane uh, 
cover, excuse me, and then we just put that wing nut on and tighten it down. Of course, then we can make sure our door is closed by tightening that thumb screw. And lastly, uh, there is a, a little bungee cord that's included. We go ahead and we hook that onto the bottom of the tank there, just like so. Uh, a little bit, uh, honest opinion, slightly overkill to use the wing nut and the bungee cord. I, my honest opinion is that probably either one of those would be good, but if you want to use both to be extra secure, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, behind that, we have a brand new Interstate D-Cycle battery. Uh, this is a flooded or lead acid battery. What that means for you is it is going to carry a, a fair amount of maintenance. Uh, recommendation is once every 90 days, we're going to go ahead and we're going to pull these vent panels up. There, you, Underneath those vent panels, you will find a clear marked water level. And we're just going to maintain that water level with distilled water only. Uh, focus on the hottest of months when it does come to maintaining that. That's when you generally see that water level decrease. Now, when you're getting ready for travel or you're replacing the top back on that compartment, you are just going to, of course, line everything up as best you can on top. And then you have a standard, uh, whatever you wanna call this, a uh, uh, strap to hold that down. And you are just going to, like you would, anything else, line that up, pull that nice and tight, make sure that that lid is not gonna go anywhere. Now also, when in talking about the battery, uh, for periods of long-term storage, it's very important that we do go ahead and utilize this battery disconnect switch. Uh, what that's going to do is that that's going to isolate the, the battery from the 12 volt system. It's gonna help with any nominal or phantom draws you have on the system, and it's gonna keep that battery uh, in tip-top shape uh, while in storage. Very, very easily marked or clearly marked in that on off. Uh, again, anytime you're gonna be in for long-term storage, just go ahead and flip that into the off position. That's gonna make sure that that battery is uh, pretty close to uh, the same charge as to where you left it. Also keep in mind that that battery is gonna be maintained not only anytime you are plugged into shore power, but anytime you are going down the road uh, via the seven-way plug and your charge line equipped vehicle. On all four corners of the unit, we have stabilizer jacks. Now these stabilizer jacks are meant for stabilizing the unit, uh, keep it from feeling like you're walking around on a couple tires. Uh, they are for stabilization, they are not for leveling. It's very important to make that extra clear. Uh, if we are leveling the unit front to back, we are going to use the main tongue jack up front. Leveling from left to right is gonna be done with the tires in what's called a leveling kit. Uh, ton of different options in terms of leveling kit on the market so you'll figure out which one works for you. Uh, once you are within three degrees of level, you're then going to come down and, and lower these down. Uh, you're going to again use a corresponding crank handle or any three quarter inch uh, tool will go ahead and, and help with that. So line up the tool with the drive nut there and again uh, counterclockwise is going to crank that up. No need to really bear down when you do go into that upright position. Same on the way down. We're just going to make contact with the pavement, maybe a quarter turn more just to sure everything up, and, and that's sufficient for those stabilizer jacks. Uh, while we're here, we're going to take a look here at these data tags. Uh, this is gonna give you axle ratings, tire pressure, things like that, weight ratings. All of that information is going to be found here uh, on the driver's side front corner of the unit. So with this particular unit, the tire pressure is going to be 65 PSI. Uh, that is the max tire pressure rating of the unit, or of the tire, I should say. Uh, with any trailer tire, you do run those at that max tire pressure. Uh, so may, very important that we do maintain that 65 PSI tire pressure going down the road. Now also, not information that you are going to find here on these stickers, but since we are talking about the tires, it's a very good point or a very good time to bring up uh, the, the, the lug nut retorque procedure. Uh, these lug nuts have been torqued down to 100 foot pounds here in our shop. The manufacturer recommends a retorque procedure, uh, which includes the first 15, 25, 50, and 100 miles of initial travel. It's very important that we do go ahead and retorque those down, uh, whether that be with a click style torque wrench, a digital torque wrench. Uh, either way, we do need to 
put a torque wrench on those lug nuts to make sure that we are uh, reaching that magic number of 100 foot-pounds. Uh, next up is going to be our furnace vent here, uh, Suburban Furnace. It is a uh, propane powered appliance. A propane is the source uh, and the blower motor and ignition is going to be a 12 volt direct spark ignition. Uh, from a maintenance standpoint, not too terribly much you're going to be doing uh, with the, the unit, but it, it is very important uh, that we do not restrict the flow of these vents. It is also very important that we do keep them uh, mud daubers, flying insects, any nesting uh, insect from uh, making its way within the appliance. Uh, easiest way to do so is going to be using the aftermarket bug screens uh, that are available for purchase through our parts department. Uh, you would want to go ahead and install them uh, before using the unit uh, seriously. Uh, very important here in, in uh, Central Texas to keep those nesting insects uh, again, from, from making their nest within the appliance. Uh, all your controls are going to be done from the inside of the unit. And other than those things, it just is very important that we do not restrict the flow. Uh, you know, keep it free and clear. It does blow very hot air, uh, especially when it, uh, when it is running. Uh, dropping down low, we have your, uh, your sewage hose storage there. Now, this does run the full width of the camper. It does have an access door just like this here on the other side. Uh, and it is just a, a, its functionality is just to store your sewage hose separate uh, of anything else. So it's nice to keep things nice and sanitary, nice and clean. Uh, does have a door with a small latch on there uh, that's going to help keep everything secure. A little further back here and underneath, we have your freshwater drain. Uh, that does just have a screw on cap. Uh, and what we see greater than that is going to be the entirety of that freshwater holding tank. Uh, now it is very important that anytime the unit is going to be in storage for more than seven days that we do drain all the water from the unit. Uh, now I'm going to reference that drain point further on here as we talk about other drain locations and things like that. So just keep that in mind that 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 is the location where you are going to drain that freshwater holding tank. And keep in mind also that you only do need to drain that freshwater holding tank if you have physically uh, filled it up and it has been in use. We're going to hop back up here to the actually fill port of that freshwater holding tank uh, when it does come to use that freshwater holding tank. Uh, and again, this is going to be your boondocking option, your off-grid option. If you do not have access to full-time running water, that's going to be the time that we are, uh, of course, filling up that tank and utilizing that 12-volt water pump to draw that water up to the fixtures and make it usable. Uh, so you're going to start, you're going to stick your freshwater drinking hose uh, directly into the port there. You're going to fill, up, uh, fill it up until you are satisfied. Uh, once satisfied, we go ahead and cap it off, of course. Uh, and again, that, the location of that, the switch for that, fresh, or for that 12 volt water pump is gonna be on the inside. We'll make sure we get eyes on that. Uh, and I will probably reference this location uh, once we do so. Now dropping down below here, we have your city water connection. Uh, this is of course gonna be used in the capacity of an RV park or anywhere that you do have access to full-time running water. We're gonna go ahead and use this city water location uh, or city water port, I should say. Uh, now keep in mind that water pressure becomes very important when we do talk about the city water connection. These units have very distinct or, or very specific water pressure ratings. Uh, we are going to always want to run with a water pressure regulator. This specific water pressure regulator keeps that water pressure below 50 PSI, which is well within this unit's rating. So hook this directly onto the water source or spigot. So we're going to screw that on there. We're then going to take our spigot side of the hose, screw that directly onto the water pressure regulator. And then lastly, just like when we filled the freshwater tank, we're going to take our hose and screw that onto the trailer brown connection by rotating that trailer brown connection. So it'll be something like that. And then to remove, just the opposite. Moving on, we have your uh, one sewer outlet connection. This specific uh, dump location is going to be for gray water. Uh, gray water is going to be sink water, shower water, relatively cleaner uh, source of wastewater. Uh, 
what this is going to utilize is a standard bayonet style fitting here and then we have a standard blade valve here. Uh, now when it does come to, when it does come to uh, connecting your hose, you're going to do that the very same way this cap is removed. So you see these four prongs here along the outside of that bayonet. We're going to go ahead and put this in the halfway point, line up these keyholes, give it a quarter turn that's going to go ahead and lock it on. As you can see, your sewage hose is going to utilize those very same keyholes. Now when it does come to dump, uh, you are just going to very easily take this uh, gray water valve and you're going to pull it six inches towards the front, excuse me, towards the front of the unit and all of that gray water is going to be evacuated from this location. Uh, now keep in mind that it's very important or recommended that you keep these tanks uh, in as wet or flowing condition as you can. So what that means for you is you're going to use the onboard monitor panel and you're going to monitor those levels and you're only going to dump as necessary. Uh, or dump as that tank fills up or if you decide to change locations, uh, it's not really recommended to travel with wastewater in the tank, you're not doing yourselves any favors. Moving on here is going to be your cable satellite inlet. Uh, that is just a standard RG6 cable fitting that is designed uh, to feed those services to the designated TV area of the unit. Uh, some higher end campgrounds will provide a park cable service and just about every satellite provider is offering a uh, satellite package geared towards our viewers sp specifically. Either way, that's going to be the inlet of those services, and it does, again, just uh, terminate at the designated TV area of the camper. Uh, here is going to be your power supply. Uh, this is a 30 amp, 110 volt connection, and it does only plug into the camper one way. So if we go ahead and remove this, we can take a look at the plug, and we can notice that you have two slotted prongs and one L-shaped prong. If we go ahead and line that up in the correct orientation, it's going to plug right in for us. Uh, naturally, in its natural position, it's going to be slightly uh, off canter here in that five o'clock position. We're gonna go ahead and give that an eighth inch turn to the right there. That actually locks that cord in. And then we have this secondary collar here that we can utilize to lock it in further, kind of give us the double, double protection. Uh, this is your cord, comes with the unit. It is 30 feet in length. Uh, so keep that in mind. Now, it's a popular option for a lot of our customers to want to pre-cool that refrigerator uh, 24 to 48 hours before they take the unit out, and you can surely do so. Uh, to help with that, we have included a 30 to 15 amp puck style reducer. This works very well for pre-cooling the refrigerator and running low draw appliances on that 15 amp service. Keep in mind that if we do want to run the AC uh, or, you know, run the microwaves, some things that pull higher amps. Uh, we are going to want to upgrade this to a dog bone style reducer. What that's going to do is that's going to dissipate heat a whole lot better for those, for those high draw appliances. So keep that in mind. Uh, this is very useful and does have a place, but uh, that is for low draw appliances. We're going to hop down low here again, and we're going to take a look at the low point drains of the unit and they are going to be right there above the axle. You have two valves there, just like with any valve. Uh, if they are across the flow, they're closed. Op uh, with the flow is going to be on. And let me see if I can point out here from the other side their location. It's gonna be right here. Uh, now those are going to be the lowest point in the unit's plumbing. Uh, that becomes important when we are trying to purge the water from the unit and keep in mind that if this unit is gonna be in storage for more than seven days that we need to evacuate all of the water from the unit. Uh, we've already looked at the freshwater drain location. This is going to be part of that procedure. This is going to drain everything in between water source and fixture. So all of that in between plumbing is gonna be drained from this location here. Uh, just, just keep in mind, again, we're going to reference a couple more drain locations and then I will bring that all kind of full circle uh, and we will see how that makes sense in, in, again, evacuating all of the water from the unit. Uh, coming up here to your refrigerator panels, uh, nothing too crazy here or uh, operation-wise from this location. Uh, this is not really what we would consider a customer serviceable unit. 
Uh, you are going to, again, hear me reference the importance of bug screens to keep those nesting insects, mud daubers, flying insects from nesting within the appliance here. Uh, other than that, we'll go ahead and remove this vent. We'll give it a visual inspection a couple times a year, make sure nothing's gotten in, make sure everything is in good working order. And generally that's, that's enough to keep the appliance uh, running well. Uh, controls, are going to be, uh, controls are going to be on the inside of the unit and we're gonna make sure that we get eyes and run through the functions of those uh, when we do get to the inside. Uh, now when replacing these vents, a uh, couple things you wanna keep in mind. You want to make sure that your uh, drain hose is, is uh, set up in a location where if there is any condensation that comes from this hose, uh, that it is going to be uh, coming out of the vent here. So you got to kind of hold that into place. And while doing that, you are going to seat these top tabs. And then once we've done so, we also have a couple um, square holes that we need to line up and it should kind of snap on like so. And then we go ahead and we give this, these little tabs, we give those a, a, a quarter turn. That's going to lock it on. Very important that you always go back, give this a little tug, make sure it is in fact locked on and that it's not going to go anywhere uh, going down the road. Uh, keep in mind also, you have a bottom refrigerator vent and you have a top refrigerator vent. Uh, next up is going to be the six gallon dual source uh, water heater. So. Uh, this is, there is uh, quite a bit to this appliance, uh, not only from a safety standpoint, but from a maintenance standpoint uh, that we do need to talk about. So uh, again, six gallon capacity, uh, dual source, runs on straight 110 volt electricity, uh, also runs on propane gas with 12 volt direct spark ignition. Uh, the location of turning those sources on is going to be in two different places. Uh, we have a toggle switch right here that's going to turn on the 110 volt heating element. Uh, so keep in mind that that is the location there. And the propane, the propane switch uh, is going to be on the inside. And again, just like all the other things that I've referenced uh, from the outside that we are going to find on the inside, we will make sure that we get eyes on that switch. And again, we'll probably talk about the uh, proper uh, operation uh, when we get there. Uh, now, Manufacturer has two very specific recommendations uh, with this appliance. Uh, number one is again, anytime the unit is going to be in storage for more than seven days, it becomes very important that we do uh, drain this separate of the rest of the system, separate of the other drain locations that we've previously talked about in this presentation. Uh, manufacturer also recommends that before returning the unit back to service, that we do fill this separate of, again, the rest of the systems within the unit. So starting with the proper way to drain the unit, uh, it's very important, number one, that we give it ample time to cool down. Uh, these are very well insulated. That water within that tank is going to stay hot a lot longer than you may think. So uh, once you are confident of the temperature within the unit, it's very important that we depressurize the unit uh, before ultimately draining it. So uh, number one thing you're gonna to wanna to do when you are draining the water heaters, you're going to cut the inflow of water uh, overall to the unit. Uh, of course, there's two ways to do that. If you are on city water connection, it, it becomes as simple as turning off that incoming water valve or physically disconnecting the hose from the uh, hose port on the side. And then if we are using city, or excuse me, using the potable water tank and that 12 volt water pump, it becomes as easy as just turning that 12 volt water pump switch off. Uh, now, with no new water pressure or no new water pressurizing the system, uh, we are then going to uh, find the hot side of, of any internal water fixture within the unit. So, whether that's the kitchen sink, bathroom sink, uh, we are just going to very simply open up that hot water valve, and we are going to see a little bit of water come from the fixture. Uh, once that water has dissipated, and you see no new water coming from that fixture. That's our indicator that this unit is depressurized and it is, good to, it is safe for us to go ahead and drain that further. Now, once we've depressurized the unit, we're gonna come here with an inch and a 16 socket. And uh, generally you'll need an extension and a ratchet as well. And we are gonna go ahead and remove this drain plug here. Once we have removed that drain plug, we're going to see the remaining four to five gallons of water that are within the appliance go ahead and evacuate from this location here. Now, 
Once we've removed that drain plug, you are going to find that on the other end of this drain plug is an anode rod. Now what an anode rod does is it acts like a magnet for hard water deposits, calcification, things like that. They deposit onto that anode rod and eat away at that as opposed to the inside of the water heater. Now it is a consumable part. Generally we see our customers get a year or two uh, in between changing that anode rod. Uh, and you, that is something that you are going to source from an RV dealer. Starts out about three quarters of an inch by 12 inch. By the time it needs to be replaced, it looks about the size of a pencil and, and is very decrepit. It is clearly in need of some work. Uh, so most people don't have uh, any trouble figuring out when they need to change it. Uh, again, you're going to know the location. You're going to know the uh, know when it's time to change because you should be draining this water heater anytime the unit is going to be in store for more than seven days. So kind of to bring that whole uh, purging scenario uh, full circle. Uh, and so we can drain the unit 100% of the water. If the fresh water tank has been in use, we're going to reach on the underside and we are going to remove that uh, cap on the bottom of the fresh water holding tank that's going to drain, of course, from that location. Next up, we're going to come here uh, below the axle or in between the axle and the frame and we are going to open up those low point drains and we're going to drain the water from that location as well. Lastly, we're going to use that, that procedure that we just talked about to go ahead and drain the water heater finally. Once we've done all three of those things, this unit is ready for storage uh, and, and you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, from a sanitary issue uh, or, or anything like that. Uh, generally here in this, this part of Texas, that's the, the extent of most people's winterization process. You have to make that decision personally for yourself, uh, but that is how you empty all of the water from the unit. Now, when I initially started talking about the water heater, I referenced that it's very important that once we return the unit back to service, that we do physically uh, fill this back up with water to, so before we start heating it. That becomes very important. You don't wanna dry fire the unit or heat the unit without any water um, within the unit. So what that means for you is uh, of course you are going to make sure your anode rod is uh, you know back into service and then we are uh, going to pressurize the system. Uh, that just like we spoke of before if we are on that city water connection we physically turn that valve on. If we are uh, utilizing the water tank we're going to turn that water pump on. Uh, once that system is pressurized we're then going to, again, go to the hot side of the fixture. We're going to turn that valve in the on position. Uh, you're going to see a little bit different outcome at this point. You're going to see that, that you're going to see a lot more water come from that, number one, but that flow is going to be very interrupted. It's going to be very spitty. It's going to uh, kind of be on and off. Uh, what that's doing is it's displacing the air that is now within the tank and replacing it with water. So uh, once that flow normalizes at that fixture, once we see that flow run true, that is our indicator that this has been filled with six gallons of water. We can then start heating that water, again, choosing our source, whether that's the 110 volt uh, heating element, which the toggle switch is located here uh, beneath the propane regulator or the propane with, direct, with 12 volt direct spark ignition, which again, we're gonna get eyes on that switch once we get there to the inside. Uh, lastly, when we talk about the water heater, uh, it is again very important to note that you do have this screened mesh as well as these louvers. And just like with the refrigerator and the furnace, it is very important that we do protect those from uh, any flying insect or, or nesting insect. Uh, again, it's going to be my recommendation that you do use those secondary bug screens to do so. And we would be happy to install those for you uh, or help you uh, pick out the right, the right ones. Uh, now when it comes to closing it, of course you have this tab here, uh, may need to kind of seat that or line that up with the opening there. Uh, once we are uh, in place, we go ahead and pull that, it's on a little spring and rotate it, that's going to hold that door closed when you're going down the road. So here we have your Blackwater uh, bayonet fitting as well as your Blackwater dump valve. This is going to uh, operate for the most part at the very same way as the uh, gray water. So uh, one important difference to take note in is that it is very important that we keep this black water valve in the closed position. We're again gonna use that monitor panel on the inside and we are only going to dump as necessary. 
even more important that we do so with this black water tank uh, because we have solid, not only solid body waste, but we have toilet paper, all of that stuff within the tank that is constantly compounding. And we want to keep that in as wet or flowing condition as we can. So uh, again, we're going to note that we're going to use the monitor panel on the inside. We're going to watch that tank fill up when it becomes full or we are wanting to dump. We are then going to hook up our sewage hose here and we're going to pull that valve in this case towards six inches towards the rear uh, of the vehicle. Again, I can't stress that enough. Very important that we do uh, keep that in as wet or flowing condition as we can. Uh, also, it, it becomes an important time to talk about the products that we're using uh, to keep that black water system nice and, and as fresh as we possibly can. Uh, first off, we're gonna use a single ply RV grade toilet paper, number one. And number two, we're gonna use a deodorizing product, whether that's a drop in, pour in, uh, any of those, again, just like with anything else, a uh, ton of options on the market. You're going to figure out which one works well for you. Uh, just about it. So other than that, we're going to move on here to the pass-through compartments. Now, you have a door here on either side. You have this nice open compartment. This is the largest compartment that I've seen uh, come equipped with an R-Pod. So uh, when we close that door. Uh, we have a magnetic hold open, which is a nice feature. We close that door. We have one latch side. So we're going to make sure we push in and make sure that that's lined up correctly because this does spin. So you're going to want to make sure that you have that orientated correctly. And once we've latched that, we're going to take, uh, in this case, going to be the gray Bauer key. And we are going to lock that compartment. Now this this gray key is going to be what you're going to be used for the uh, other side of the compartment as well. All of these compartments are on that common key. Uh, here on the rear end, of course, we have your rear stabilizer jacks. Those, those are going to function just like we saw there on the front. We have your tail lights, uh, marker lights up top, license plate bracket down low. We also have your full size spare tire. Uh, now, when it does come to changing a tire, it's very important. Jack placement becomes very important. We're going to put that jack directly on the axle as close to the tire as we can without it interfering in our work. And then we are, uh, of course, going to uh, remove that tire, replace with this spare tire. Uh, coming around here, again, just the other side of that, of that pass-through compartment functions the very same way as we've seen. Uh, we have down low... And let me get my bearings here. Down low, we have your, uh, your outside all-weather outlet, just a standard 15-amp outlet with an all-weather cover. Uh, helpful if you're wanting to run some 110-volt appliances here on your uh, porch area. Excuse me, then we have this black tank flush. Now, this black tank flush is a very important part of that black water system. This corresponds with a jet inside the black water tank. Uh, specifically designed to help blast off compounded waste, body waste, things like that. So once we've uh, went and dumped from that black water location, uh, we've pulled that valve, we've dumped all that waste. We're going to go ahead and we're going to leave that black water valve in the open position. We're going to hook up a wastewater hose. So a, a, a separate hose, any old garden hose will do. We're going to hook up here to this hose connection and we're going to allow that jet to rinse that black water tank it's going to be my recommendation that we do go ahead and use this black tank flush uh, every single time we go ahead and dump. And it is very important to, again, stress the fact that that black water valve needs to be in the open position. Uh, that way we do not overflow that black water holding tank. Um, also down low here, we have a little uh, D-ring, triangular ring here. Uh, you can go ahead and, and I think they, they sell that as a place to leash up your uh, dog or something like that. But that is, again, going to be the location of that. Uh, here with the steps, uh, very easily fold the bottom one in first. And then the rest slide in as well. Of course, pulling out will be the same thing in reverse. We also have your uh, assist rail here. Uh, locks in the outward position, you would lift up and you can fold it against the uh, camper for travel or against the door, uh, whichever you prefer. So we have your entry door uh, lock handle here, uh, entry door handle. 
Uh, this is equipped with not only a deadbolt lock, but also a latch lock as well. So it's gonna utilize this purple key here. Uh, when we want to lock that deadbolt, we of course insert the key. We turn uh, the direction uh, of the deadbolt activation, which is in this case is gonna be towards the left. Uh, and then we return back to center and that allows us to remove the key. That door is now in the, the that deadbolt I should say is in that lock position. To unlock, we go ahead and of course do the opposite, which turn to the right, return to center, remove the key. Now we also have a latch lock, which is going to uh, lock the, the activation of this actual, the, the handle actually. And that's going to, that cylinder is going to uh, operate a little different. So you, you put the key in, you turn to the right in this case, and then you can just go ahead and remove the key uh, no need to return back to sender, uh, center. Uh, and again, just to stress, they do use that same key. So we're gonna go ahead and unlock it and we'll it, let it be. Uh, moving further forward here, we're gonna see the other side of our sewage hose storage. Again, just like we saw on the other side, does have a door uh, on both sides, does run the full width of the camper. Uh, last but not least, here up front, we have a um, a auxiliary propane port, uh, quick disconnect uh, operation. So you have a valve here. We're gonna make sure that we turn that valve in the off position and we would slide this locking collar back. Of course, ins insert the corresponding male plug. Once fully inserted, that's gonna spring back, lock on. And then to feed gas to that appliance, we just go ahead and turn that valve on. Very important that when we are traveling, we go ahead and push that dust guard in place to keep any debris from uh, depositing within the fitting. Uh, also here on the outside, uh, some things we're going to talk about when we do get to the inside is going to be the operation of the stereo and the outside speakers and of course your porch light. Uh, just about covers it here on the exterior of the RPOD 171. We're going to hop on the inside and we're going to take a look at those features. Hi guys, so here we are on the inside of the RPOD 171. Uh, here at the rear of the unit, just a couple things that we need to talk about. Uh, number one is going to be uh, the lights up top. Now there is a main switch for these lights where most of the lights here on the uh, ceiling of the unit uh, can be controlled with one common switch. Uh, if you want to pick which ones come on with that switch, uh, there is a little push button here on the center of that lens uh, that's going to easily turn those lights on and off individually. Uh, also, uh, we get a, a nice example of the style of shades that they're using within the unit. Uh, if we reach underneath the valise here and we get a good hand on that shade, it is just a friction style pull down shade. Uh, also a couple things here in the bed area. Uh, there is a receptacle here on the uh, sidewall uh, that is going to be uh, one of two receptacles here in the uh, bed area. The other one's going to be here on the other side of the refrigerator. Uh, also, it's very important to note that here on the driver's side wall, you do have your emergency exit. Uh, that window is going to differ in operation uh, when it becomes an emergency exit. Of course, you have these two handles here. Uh, if there is the event of an emergency, you would go ahead and lift up those handle. That window is going to pull full out or swing full out to allow you to evacuate from that location. Uh, other than that, uh, the window still operates just like the rest of the windows within the unit. You have a locking tab here that you can go ahead and pull and allow that window to open. And you're going to see that uh, commonality throughout the rest of the windows within the unit. Uh, also, uh, hopping up here, we have your uh, Dometic two-way refrigerator. So it runs on propane gas as well as 110 volt electricity. Uh, we have it running on propane gas right now. Uh, we know it's running on propane gas because uh, just like this little picture here on the fridge says, uh, that switch is kind of protruding a little bit. That means it's running on gas. Excuse me. Other than that, there is no real indicator that it is on on gas. Uh, except for if we encounter any problems through that lighting cycle, it's going to go ahead and illuminate this check light. Now keep in mind that this appliance runs very efficiently on gas. So when it does come to lighting it on gas, uh, it's not like an instantaneous thing. You may have to go through, especially if the unit has been sitting for quite a while, you may need to go through one or two lighting cycles 
uh, before you actually get it to turn on on gas and, and start cooling that refrigerator on gas. And again, you'll know that it has uh, failed through that lighting cycle because it'll illuminate this check light. Uh, now, if we want to run it on auto or AC, we're going to go ahead and depress that gas button. And then we can see it, it has illuminated this auto light here. And that's going to run uh, as the primary source being uh, 110 volt electricity. And then if we were to interrupt that primary source, it's going to automatically start lighting on gas. And then lastly, the only button that we have here is going to be the on off switch. Uh, here on this wall, we have a cool little clothes hanger. Uh, actually, it lifts up here from the top. Uh, gives you some way, since there's, there's no notable closet space within this small of a unit, it gives you somewhere to hang some clothes. Uh, that way, uh, they're not all wrinkly. Uh, and then we have your Eric Cell thermostat here. Um, up or down arrows to control temperature on that thermostat. Very, very simple, very basic. And then we have one mode button. So once I hit that mode button, you can see we have fan speed controls. We have low, high, and auto, or excuse me, just low and high on that fan speed. And then that takes us right there into the uh, air conditioner options. And we have cool high, so high is the fan speed and we are, uh, the air conditioner or cool is the mode. And then we hit it one more time, it takes us into the low fan speed. And then one more time is gonna take us into that low fan speed with an auto shut off. So what that means is that uh, temperature that's set here is going to, once the thermostat reaches that temperature, it's going to automatically shut down the AC. Uh, and you'll see that kind of as we go through the rest of the features as well. Once we exit those air conditioner features, that takes us right there into that thermos or right there into that furnace. Uh, once we go ahead and we enter that furnace mode, it's going to kick that blower motor on immediately. Uh, that blower motor is located underneath the uh, dinette of the front of the unit. And once, we've, once that blower motor kicks on, 16 seconds after that, it actually ignites. By that 30 second mark, it's producing noticeable heat. Uh, and it, it works again, very efficiently in a space of this size. Uh, last but not least, or, or last is going to be turning us back to the off mode. Uh, that furnace, so once we've lit that furnace, takes about two minutes of a cool down procedure. So it's not, that fan's not gonna stop immediately. Uh, down low here, we have your uh, breaker box and fuse panel. Everything we find here on the right of that breaker box is going to be a 12 volt appliance. That's going to utilize a automotive blade style fuse, which you can source uh, not only at any RV dealer, but as well as any auto parts store. It's gonna be my recommendation that you keep a spare set of fuses with the unit. Uh, as fate would have it, if you don't have a spare, you'll probably almost immediately need one. In terms of function, that's gonna be outlined right here on the door, and you see that it has a description for each one of those fuse holders. Uh, here on the left is going to be our, our resettable 110 volt light switch style breakers, uh, just like you're gonna find in your fuse panel box at home. And again, in terms of function, they are labeled right here on the door. Uh, hopping up here, uh, we have the light switch for the bathroom. Um, toggle switch here, again, that light switch within the bat, the restroom has its own um, switch right there on the fixture. Now, stepping further here in, out of the way of the door, uh, we can talk a little bit about the wet bath more. Uh, of course, here is going to be your uh, toilet, uh, it has a, a pool style flush uh, here on the right side of the bowl. It's going to be a light pool to go ahead and feed water to that bowl. It's our recommendation that you always keep some water in the bowl. That's going to help keep those bad smells down. And then once we've used the restroom, we're going to give it a full pool towards us to go ahead and actually open up that valve and flush it. Uh, we also have uh, a standard uh, small sink here within the unit with a diverter to feed for the shower. Uh, shower head does have an on off uh, switch on the head. What that allows you to do is since most of the time you'll find yourself doing military or Navy style showers, uh, what you're going to find is that the easiest way to conserve that water is gonna be turning it off at the head. That way you're not going to have to change your mixture here on the valves itself. Uh, lastly, in the uh, wet bath here, we have a uh, fan, uh, should be stowed in that lock position. 
Once we go ahead and we unlock it, we can go ahead and crank it open. And then we have four fan speeds here uh, with this push button. Uh, and then of course the fan off speed there. Once we're done, we go ahead and shut it and lock it down. Down low here we have the Roadvac. Uh, this is a really cool feature with these R-Pods. Uh, you have a couple options here. So you have a, a port here that would accommodate a hose. Of course that hose is not a, a, a equipped with this kind of basic setup, but you can always contact Roadvac and add that hose if you think you might use it. Uh, you have an on off toggle switch here specifically to turn on that hose port. And then if we move here uh, to the right, we also have a, a, a component of that road vac. Now this is going to get loud here for a second, but if I lift that up, you can see we kind of have like a dustpan mode of that road vac, which it doesn't matter if this switch is in the on off position or not. Uh, idea being is you could gather your dust with a, 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 a broom, swing it to this location, and it's gonna suck that right up. Uh, now this is a bag system, or this does run a bag. Uh, to change that bag, you're going to uh, go ahead and pull on this tab that's going to allow that to go ahead and remove. And it is looking like our bag was not hooked up. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure that filter's in place. We're gonna take our bag. Uh, we are going to fit it over that location there. And we're going to make sure that, well, it's probably easier if we do the, the back portion first, is we're going to put that there. We're going to make sure that's seated there. And then we go ahead and align the tabs here on my left side first. Go ahead and pull that, and we're good to go. Right above that, we have a very important piece of safety equipment. That's going to be your carbon monoxide and propane leak detector. Uh, this is wired into the 12 volt section of the camper, so it becomes very important uh, that we do go ahead and test that every single time we take the unit out. It has a test button, functions very much like a smoke alarm. Uh, we will go ahead and, and you can see here on the front that it does have a, um, a kind of a guide as to what these, these flashing lights mean when it does indicate to you. Uh, just keep in mind that we do want to go ahead and test that uh, every single time we take the unit out. Now I'm gonna hop up momentarily here just because we are talking about safety equipment and reference the smoke alarm here that we have up on the ceiling. That is a standard nine volt smoke alarm, same variant you're going to find uh, in your household. And again, along with the, uh, with the propane or the carbon monoxide detector, it is very important that we do test this every single time we take the unit out. Uh, now down low here, we have your, uh, your high point convection oven. Uh, this is a three-way oven. It's a convection, uh, a microwave, as well as a grill. Uh, these work exceptionally well. Controls are very straightforward here on the, uh, the display. Uh, you would choose your mode here out of the top, and then, of course, your time and temperatures down here below. Uh, here on the inside, you're going to uh, find your turntable, your convection uh, grate, as well as your heating element here on the top uh, with your instructions. Uh, another 110 volt 15 amp receptacle here in the kitchen. Uh, we also have a couple USBs uh, up there as well. Uh, now we have your suburban cooktop here. Uh, now this is going to be a very basic kind of camping style cooktop. Uh, is equipped with this nice glass uh, top. We would of course lift that first. We're going to choose our burner and we're going to turn that on to light. Now there is no sparker or igniter on this appliance. So we need to go ahead and, and make sure that we have a long stem barbecue lighter uh, with the appliance. And again, we're gonna light that other burner as well. Uh, becomes very easy to do so. Now, one thing to note is that if we've been using this to prepare a meal, we wanna give it nice and ample time to cool down before we go ahead and shut this grate. Uh, also here in the kitchen, we have uh, two other lights here underneath the cabinet. Uh, now keep in mind that these are not on that main switch, so these will be needing to turn, uh, be turned on and off separately. Uh, nice round sink here with the, this uh, plastic countertop extender as well. Uh, nice, very cool setup that they have here. Uh, of course, not really much to be said about that other than what has already been said. Um, 
cabinetry up top here. Uh, again, nothing too, too crazy. Uh, up high, I guess one thing to, not to jump around, but one thing to note is going to be the location of the air conditioner filters. I know we already talked about the thermostat, but uh, this is the actual unit. We have two tabs here on either side or two louvers, however you want to call it. And these can be kind of stuck in here, but they have little thumb tabs here and you kind of work that out. Uh, once that has been removed, you're going to see the filter here. Uh, and again, as, as easy or as best you can, uh, go ahead and pop that filter out, get a fingernail underneath of it. Now these are washable filters. You can go ahead and wash them right there in the sink. Uh, make sure you let them dry uh, before putting them back in and uh, operating the air conditioner. And then putting this guy back in, just line up the orientation correctly, seat those tabs first, and then just snap that in as well. Um, one thing to speak of is going to be the stereo system here. Uh, this is running the IRV technology Bluetooth unit. Uh, this, of course, has this, this top button is going to be the on off button or mute button. Um, and then, of course, we have the volume button here. Uh, next up is going to be the Bluetooth button. If we push that and hold, that should send us uh, into that Bluetooth mode. And then, of course, our connectability will be through our phone at that point. AM and FM radio is next. Of course, that's just going to switch between those two sources. And then we have an auxiliary source as well, which is going to be either for this USB inlet or this HDMI uh, inlet here. Uh, we control the volume of each zone separate. You can see one uh, is on or off, and then we control that volume. Uh, one is going to, or zone one is going to be uh, the zone on the interior of the unit. Zone two is going to be the outside zone. Uh, you're not only indicated whether they're on or off uh, via the display, but if that zone is off, it is lighted red here. If that zone is on, it is lighted blue here. And then again, to turn off, we hold that, that power button as well as the mute button. Excuse me. That's going to go ahead and turn that display off. Uh, it does also have a remote here that is going to uh, have all of the same features that we saw on the display itself. Uh, now, I'm going to kind of slide here into the dinette and we are going to talk about uh, what we have here on this side of the unit. Uh, we have first off is going to be your main GFI outlet. All of the receptacles in this unit are going to be on the same circuit. Uh, and this is going to be the reset of those outlets. So if one of them gets overloaded, one of them uh, gets overtaxed, it's going to pop that GFI outlet. This is, of course, going to be the reset location. As long as we see that green light, that means everything's up to par and running correctly. Uh, and then uh, to the right of that, we have uh, your courtesy panel, convenience center, it goes by many names. We have these tank monitors up front. Those tank monitors uh, have been referenced throughout this uh, presentation. Uh, battery is going to read full. Battery reads full anytime you're plugged into shore power. To get a true readout of where your battery sits, you need to go ahead and unplug from shore power and then test here from this location. Fresh water is two thirds full. We've went ahead and filled that tank for our testing purposes. Black water is empty. Gray water is empty. So the more light you see here on the scale, the fuller that tank is. And then down low, we have your water pump switch. Uh, we've talked about that 12 volt water pump switch that's going to draw that water uh, up from the fixtures and make that usable. And then we have the propane switch here for uh, the water heater. So we, when we were on the exterior of the unit, we went ahead and we saw the 110 volt uh, switch or the 110 volt heating element switch. Uh, here we have the propane switch. So uh, I'm sure you can see that fault light there coming on and off. Uh, that fault light uh, is essentially your indicator on whether or not the unit has lit. So it's going to, that light will flash on and off through its lighting cycle. Uh, its lighting cycle uh, has three tries. If it does not light by the end of that third cycle, it's gonna go ahead and stop trying. Uh, that fault light will remain on. What that means is, is maybe you're out of propane gas up front. 
Maybe your bottle uh, is not turned on, but either way, ultimately it means that that water heater has not lit on propane. Uh, in the event that that happens, uh, again, go uh, again. it's not one of those things that if the lines are empty, it's going to light on the first time every time. So uh, in the event that that happens, of course, make sure your bottle's on. If it's on, that's excellent. Make sure you have propane in the tank. If you have both of those things, uh, generally the issue is it just, not has, it just hasn't made its way from the bottle to the appliance. Uh, if that happens, just as, it's as simple as turning that switch off, turning it back on, and letting it go through another lighting cycle. Uh, as long as you've corrected the issue and you actually have propane gas running through the line, it will light on the first try of that second cycle generally. Uh, we are going to hop up and we're gonna demo how this dinette folds down into a bed uh, as best we can with our space restrictions. Uh, as you can see, it is buckled down for travel. Uh, Forest River includes this buckle. Uh, of course, there's a reason for them to do so. Although I've never personally seen these, these tables uh, kind of move from their set location, but if the strap's there, go ahead and use it. So we first unbuckle the table itself, and then it's gonna make things nice and easy for us if we go ahead and, and kind of get these cushions out of the way preemptively. That makes everything kind of nice and smooth. So we can stack these up by the door. So this is a pedestal style uh, dinette, the far more most popular option you're gonna find within any camper. So what that means is you have two legs in this case that are held uh, in two flanges uh, by friction. So uh, these can really be wedged in here at times. So you may see me kind of wrestle with this and, and I would expect to kind of do that same kind of maneuver when you actually go to do this. It's just kind of the way, the way it happens sometimes. So uh, if you get lucky, the tabletop's gonna come off of the legs first, but there's no guarantee in that. And it looks like, um, looks like I was halfway lucky because I have one leg that has, I have one leg that has stayed in the floor flange and one leg that has stayed in the table flange. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and work that loose. It's okay to go ahead and put these on the floor in the meantime. Again, I'm gonna work that one loose. And now we see we have these black bump bumpers in these four locations here on the corners. We're gonna go ahead, set that tabletop as best we can there on those bumpers. And I think in this case, And then we take our cushions and we lay them out. And there you have that secondary sleeping area. Uh, of course, I'm not going to bore you with the reverse uh, portion. So, of course, I'm not going to bore you with the, rever the reverse of that to setting it back up. Um, it's, it's, again, pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, so, hopping here to the uh, television area. Uh, number one, of course, you have uh, a safety band, very much like the table. Uh, to go ahead and unbuckle that. Uh, that's on a swivel, so that TV can go swivel uh, towards the back bed, or if you're in the dinette, you can watch it there. You really have a multi-positional uh, arm here that is going to uh, accommodate you throughout the unit, uh, no matter where you're at. Uh, now, other than, uh, of course, having an on-off switch on the TV, of course, you have your remote here, uh, just like your TV at home, uh, on off, uh, very straightforward. Of course, uh, we can see that TV light up there. Uh, not gonna, not gonna be much different than what you're used to seeing. Uh, although this is a 12 volt TV. So you do have access to this. If you are off grid, uh, it will run off of your battery power. And then also, uh, on the roof of this unit, we have a omnidirectional digital over the air television antenna. 
To turn that antenna on, it's going to be pushing this button here. And that's gonna go ahead and turn that antenna on. So what we need to do from there is we're gonna go ahead and do a channel search on the television. And it's gonna search out the best available signal for your location and bring in, uh, again, the over-air programming dependent on that location. You see you have two uh, cable fittings here, standard RG6 cable fittings. Uh, this one here that we're plugged in is going to be for your part cable service. And because your antenna and your part cable service share that same pathway, it's very important that if we want to utilize that part cable service that we do go ahead and turn that light off. Uh, if we're utilizing the satellite side of that, uh, it's going to be this secondary plug here. Uh, and then very easily before we travel, we want to go ahead and uh, fold this in. We want to take our band, make sure that's nice and snug, and then we can go ahead and turn the TV off. Uh, a couple of light switches here below the TV. One is, of course, going to be the porch light on and off. We've seen that light uh, when we are on the exterior of the unit. And the next one's going to be the main ceiling light. So as promised, uh, all of those lights are on that same switch. And again, just to, as a reminder, you can choose which ones come on and off with that switch. Uh, the only ones that, are, again, are not on that switch is going to be the cabinets over the sink uh, and the bathroom. Uh, dropping down low here, we have your uh, fire extinguisher and just like the same with the rest of your safety equipment, it's very important that we do test this every single time we take the unit out. To test it, we're going to push that green tab down. If it springs back, that means we have life within the unit. If it stays depressed, it's time to go ahead and pull out and replace. And then we also have the dog bowl here. Uh, that's kind of part of Forest River's pet package, uh, as they call it. Uh, with the, the leash hookup that we've seen on the exterior, and then you have the stainless steel dog uh, bowls included. Uh, lastly, here at the entry door, um, you do have your built-in screen door, which is nice. Uh, if you choose to use that, you can go ahead and, uh, again, this is kind of fiddly from this side, uh, but you can go ahead and close that door. And then, of course, you have your uh, screen door there. And then normal operation, is it is going to be uh, hooked on to that entry door so you're not having to move that out of the way every single time. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this walkthrough here on the RPOD 171. Uh, we hope we answered all of your questions. If there's something we may have forgotten or you, you need a little bit more information on, feel free to give us a call. Uh, again, we hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, my name is Drew with Princess Craft RV. Uh, thank you very much.